The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art, I'm Ben Luke. This week, the art newspaper's annual survey of museum attendance is out. Just how many visitors and how much money have museums lost in the pandemic? And how have digital initiatives helped? I talked to the art newspaper's Jose de Silva about the 77% global fall in visitor numbers and the financial impact. And we talked to Chris Unit, the founder of One Further, a digital consultancy for the arts industry, about museums' work in the digital field, how effective it's been and how it might be used in the future. And we hear about a Titian painting that two guests on our sister podcast, A Brush With, visited together. Before all that, why not sign up to the Art Newspaper's Art Market High newsletter for a monthly guide to the art trade. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top right of the page. And while you're there, you can sign up for a range of our other newsletters, including our daily email. Now, every year the Art Newspaper compiles a survey of visitor figures at museums across the world, charting the most thronging institutions and the best visited shows, reflecting the millions of people in every corner of the globe who journey to see their favourite art. 2020 was, of course, a year like no other, with the great cultural spaces closed for much of the year, the British Museum shut for 208 days, the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington for 225. Reading this year's survey is sobering. It's no longer a marker of museum success, Instead, it's a story about their capacity for survival. I spoke to Jose de Silva, our exhibitions editor, who alongside Emily Sharp compiled the report about this year's findings. Jose, we knew from the start that this would be a different process this year. Can you say something about how you went about it? Well, I guess the main thing was um, when we started compiling this survey earlier this year was that we knew very well that 2020 would look very different from previous um previous surveys we've done over the past couple of decades. And I guess the main thing we did this year differently from previous years was focus more on general museum attendance as opposed to specific exhibition attendance because museums had such, their kind of opening times were broken up with several lockdowns, they had reduced hours. Some museums, when they reopened after their first or second lockdowns, they um, they cut their opening times from, say, seven days a week to five days a week. And because we usually compare exhibitions worldwide um, on a kind of visitors per day basis, it became, I mean, it would have taken probably the whole of this year just to gather that information and, and figure it out and, and, and work out who was number one. I mean, we have a kind of vague idea of the most popular exhibitions around the world, but it's not really fair to compare them as there were so many variables in 2020. Right. So you zoned in on general museum attendance at museums across the world, basically. That's right, yeah. The museum attendance for the calendar year, so from 1st of January till 31st of December. We kind of contacted museums um, all around the world, as we usually do, um, usually around 400, 500 museums. Um, We got data for around over 300 museums this year. And within that, we could then compare how different regions were affected by different lockdowns, um, by different approaches to the coronavirus pandemic. And yeah, we focus mostly on, on, on that kind of aspect. We'll get into the numbers in a minute, but how was the response to that? Because, of course, you know, you're contacting press offices at museums and press offices want to sugarcoat their institution's <laughs> data. There's no doubt about that. Of course, they want to, to give you positive messages. You can't sugarcoat the fact that the museums have lost so many visitors, can you really? No, not at all. I think there were several museums and several major museums that spoke to us and that we know spoke to each other and were very worried about um, being compared with with other museums. But obviously, because this is, without stating the obvious, a global pandemic, yeah, every museum we spoke to was affected by it in some form. Some, some were lucky to be in countries that dealt with it better than others. I mean, we've been kind of careful, even though we have a table of the most popular museums in 2020, we're kind of careful not to just sort of compare museums and say, you know, this this museum beat this museum as though it's kind of a badge of honour because there are so many caveats. For example, even though in the UK, um, as a quick example, the um, Tate Modern was the most visited museum in 2020, and usually it tends to be the British Museum. And the reason for that was not because the Tate had some great shows on, which they did, but 
was because they were simply open for an extra month. They, after the first lockdown in, in the summer, they reopened in July, whereas the British Museum opened in August. So you have all these kind of things to factor in. And then the other thing, obviously, I mean, on a more personal level, a very noticeable thing this year was from our researchers, and then later on from when I was speaking to museums, was that you'd email your usual contacts and they'd only be working two days a week now, as opposed to full time, or someone's gone on further, or most of these press officers are working from home. So it's rather than just checking with their manager very quickly, everything gets slowed down a bit. And it was very obvious to us from the start that it wasn't just a big drop in figures that we would be reporting on. It was also a kind of human story behind this. Yeah, exactly. So in other words, that you were dealing with vastly changed institutions, not just in terms of the numbers of people that were coming in through the doors, but in terms of the very organisations themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, every year we always get a, a number of kind of emails that bounce back because people move on. But this year, there were loads more or, yeah, as I said, people were working part time because they were made to work part time or they were sharing shifts sometimes and things like that. So, I mean, we would like to thank all those press officers, you know, hundreds of them for filling out the forms. Pretty much on the whole, the museums in the end kind of shared their figures. The few didn't want to, but I mean, they had their own reasons for not for not doing that. Yeah, exactly. You're right to say that that we don't look. I mean, look, I've got the table in front of me here in the, in the art newspaper and and i'm i'm conscious that i'm looking at this table not as a who came first you know who got the best figures but very much at who was closed for the largest number of days what the percentage fall in visitors is and that's the story and that's the headline it's about mu- museums across the world being shut for a very very large number of days and therefore the visitor numbers dropping dramatically yes on the whole museums were shut for you know especially in the uk for example around half the year and on the whole, I mean, our, our average for kind of global top 100 museums in 2019 and top 100 museums in 2020, there was a fall of 77% in attendance, even though they were closed for around half a year. And obviously that's because most museums, when they reopened, had uh, severe restrictions in the, in the number of people they could allow into the museum and also other factors such as huge drops in tourism played a part in that. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit because we'll, we'll go region by region in a moment, but I wanted to talk first about one detail of the UK figures because it's really interesting because I noticed that in your report on that, that, for instance, you had pretty healthy figures, of course, for January and February, and then it's the point from lockdown in March that you really get the dramatic fall. So even if the headline figure says that Tate Modern had a fall of 77%, in visitor numbers yes it doesn't even present the true picture because the fall from march to the end of the year is much more dramatic right Uh, yes that's right there are several museums in the uk that are directly funded by the government they release their figures by month so we're able to look at that in a bit more detail so that obviously the first three months of the year or two and a half months of the year before the lockdown here in in march museums were operating at a kind of level that would be expected and they had very kind of healthy figures um, and then you look at the kind of second half of the year when they reopened. So several museums opened in July and August um, in the UK. There was a kind of dramatic drop in monthly visitors. So, for example, I think the biggest drop we saw um, was at the British Museum. That kind of, there was a drop of 90% in terms of like the early months of the year compared to the later months of the year. And that is obviously because they were open for fewer days and with kind of very, very restricted numbers. And as I've kind of touched upon Museums like the British Museum are very reliant on tourism for their visitor numbers. So in a normal kind of year, they have around 70 to 80% of their own visitors are from abroad. There's a similar kind of thing at the National Gallery, it's around 60%. Uh, the v and Tate, around 50% of their visitors come from abroad. And obviously, when, when the lockdown began, the tourism just dropped off a cliff, basically. So you, you, know, you have that, and then you have kind of restrictions the restrictions on muse- on kind of figures within that the museums could let in after they reopened following the kind of first and second lockdown varied by museum, but their maximum capacity was usually around 20 to 30% of what they were allowed pre-pandemic. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how things were uh, restricted. Um, let's talk about it sort of region by region, as I say. So in Asia, of course, that was where the first lockdowns kicked in. What were the figures from Asia like? Yes, the second most popular museum in the world this year, same as last year, was the National Museum of China. In 2019, they had 7.4 million visitors. And this year they had uh, 1.6 million visitors. And that was because they were one of the first museums to close. So they closed um, at the end of January, just as the kind of Chinese New Year celebrations were beginning, or they weren't beginning, they were cancelled by the authorities in Beijing. They closed for uh, three months and then they were, once they reopened, they went from being able to 
have around 30,000 visitors per day before the pandemic to only being allowed to have 3,000 visitors. So it's a 90% drop in numbers. And then that crept up a bit as the year went on, as things kind of eased, but only to about 25% of the pre-pandemic level. We weren't able to get figures for one of the uh, major Wuhan museums, the, the Hubei Provincial Museum. And they were one of the first museums, obviously, to lock down. They closed on the 23rd of January until for half the year until June. But we did kind of come across a nice story there where the, the director, Fan Quinn, joined his staff because there were such restrictions in the city in terms of moving around. He and around 70 members of staff actually um, took up residence at the museum. So he, saw, he says the story that we had from him, from him was that he packed up um, sort of pillows, a rice maker, some <laughs> sweet potatoes and various other kind of food stuffs and uh, joined his staff and and lived at the museum for several months during the, the more kind of severe lockdown in Wuhan. So basically quarantined within the museum. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's a kind of like a scene from a, a night at the museum, the, the Ben Stiller film. So in Asia, obviously, the lockdowns were much earlier. And so the, the second most visited museum in Asia was in, was in Japan, was, was in uh, Kanazawa, um, the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Art, which had 971,000 visitors in 2020. Um, and that was closed for 66 days. I mean, that's at the kind of lower end of the spectrum in terms of closures, reflecting kind of Japan's approach. And then from there, we kind of see the way we kind of wrote our report as well. It kind of ripples the kind of, as the pandemic spreads, we see lockdowns kick in elsewhere around, around the world. When the pandemic kind of arrived in Europe, or, or the European museums began to kind of close around uh, mid-March, Obviously, as, as the pandemic spread around the world, we can kind of see museums begin to close down. So as it kind of hit Europe, and first of all, mainland Europe, you can kind of see in the figures how museums are affected. So for example, as, the, as Europe began to close in March of 2020, museums such as the, uh, the Musée du Louvre in Paris, which was, again, the most popular museum in the world, they'd already got most of their visits for the year under their belt, thanks in great part to a Leonardo blockbuster they had there. But they still saw their figures drop from 9.6 million in, a, in 2019 to 2.7 million. And then the bulk of those visitors, as I say, came to the museum in the early, in, in the early parts of the year because of their um, Leonardo blockbuster, which began in 2019 and kind of folded over into February. And that was seen by an astonishing around 10,000 people a day, which is, kind of, which is also a record-breaking exhibition for the museum. Um, but after that, obviously, their figures dropped massively. You can see that kind of ripple out into other parts of Europe. But overall, um, the European museums saw their figures drop by 71%, so slightly less than the kind of global average. In the UK, shortly after, we began to close down as well. Here we had a similarly, I think it was 77%, 78% drop in, in figures overall. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, Tate Modern was the most visited museum, but that was primarily because they were open for longer than the British Museum, for example. But when you get to the United States, it gets a bit more complicated, doesn't it? Because there's such a disparity of, well, apart from anything else, a disparity of museums, but also a disparity of responses to the pandemic in the different states. Uh, that's right, yeah. One of the kind of important things that we asked museums this year was how many extra days they had to close because of the pandemic. So in, in the US, for example, it ranged from, um, I think, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas, which closed for 75 days, and you compare that to the National Museum of the American Indian in New York, which closed for 293 days. So you have these kind of vast disparities in the kind of lockdowns that museums had to adhere to. And obviously that's because of the different rules in different states around the country. Um, in California, for example, most museums shut in March and then never reopened for the rest of the year. So you have this kind of a whole year of art just lost. And that's also reflected a bit in 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 their financials as well, their museums started losing a lot of money because of this. For example, um, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in LA, to kind of alleviate some of its financial burden, they sold their director's house. It didn't belong to him, it belongs to the museum. As One of the perks of being a director of, of LACMA is that you get a, a residency as your, as your kind of, while you're director of the museum. So they sold his um, $6.6 .6 million Tudor-style home in, in, in Hancock Park to kind of help alleviate the, the financial burden, they bought a, a new house closer to the museum, which made sense for $2.2 .2 million. And since then, this year, they've sold that one as well to kind of further help uh, the museum. And apparently, um, and this story is in our diary section in the April issue, that um, the director, Michael Govan, is now living in a trailer. I don't think it's the kind of trailer that you go on holiday <laughs> to Wales in, but I'm sure it's a high-end trailer. But 
So museums have had to kind of scrabble around to, to find money to plug funding yeah. gaps, basically. And especially if they're closed for the whole, for most of 2020. Before we go on to the wider financial implications, can we talk about those areas of the, like, so, the, you know, the headline areas of the world that seem to have done well during the pandemic in terms of limited lockdowns or um, very targeted lockdowns. So, so for instance, in New Zealand, that's been the sort of poster child for, for uh, um, you know, sort of admirable responses. Was there a significantly less bad <laughs> effect in New Zealand or how did that go? There was. I think New Zealand's a really good example. I was surprised that when we asked for their figures in terms of how many days they'd closed, I was surprised that they had closed for several days. But of course, they had very strict, very quick, fast-acting lockdowns, which is why they've had, well, one of the many reasons why they've had such a good pandemic outcome so far. Um, For example, the Christchurch Art Gallery, which was closed for 54 days, saw a drop in visitors of only 28% compared to the previous year. Right. So that's 28% compared to a global average of 77%. One of the country's most popular institutions, the Museum of New Zealand, they saw their figures drop to around 840,000, a kind of 46% drop from the previous year. The silver linings in our reporting and kind of uh, survey were in New Zealand, like the Auckland Art Gallery, for example, they had to close, I think for the most days out of the ones we looked at, for 101 days. And they also had to cancel because of the kind of closed borders, they had to cancel major uh, Picasso shows and a major Monet show as well. But instead, they brought forward a one of their, in fact, their largest ever exhibition of contemporary Maori art. And that was, according to the director, one of their biggest successes ever. So they adapted and they kind of concentrated on the local, I think, and that kind of seemed to work really well. And we have some great pictures. We ask a few of the museums to kind of submit images from 2020. And, and most museums, you know, very sparsely populated, people wearing masks and, and the... Some New Zealand museums have these kind of big, almost like parties and events and outside of food trucks and everyone looking very happy and very close together that kind of, for us living in the UK, makes you feel a bit nervous, but obviously they've kind of dealt with it in a very different way. So those museums were on the whole packed. And the other thing is when they did reopen, they had some very minor restrictions, but in terms of numbers, the museums we spoke to didn't have to, did not have to limit how many people went to the museum. They had the re- recommended things like, you know, sanitizing your hands, wearing masks, but these were all kind of recommendations and, and people, they, they were allowed to kind of operate in terms of capacity as, as, as normal. Let's talk about the, the finances then, because actually, the, you know, among the, you know, as well as these sort of shocking falls in visitor numbers, it, the financial implications of, of that fall, the financial implications of having very many fewer people spending money in shops and cafes, etc., are, are really, really dramatic. So um, the, the, the headline figure from the States is the 150 million from the Met. And that was something they announced as a kind of anticipated drop in, in revenue. But I wanted to talk about the UK numbers because these are sort of more empirical data really and can you just give us some of those extraordinary headline numbers? Uh, Yes sure so we focused on the nationally funded museums and the four largest museums the four most popular museums in the UK so so Tate Modern, um, the British Museum, the National Gallery and the Victoria and Albert Museum Um, and although the figures they gave us they're kind of difficult to compare because they they measure them slightly differently. These are all kind of figures for self-generated income, so money coming in from um, ticket sales, from retail, and from donations. Um, so, for example, um, the Victorian Albert Museum saw a sixty-three percent loss in the financial year, the one that's just ending now, compared to the previous one, um, which kind of mirrors actually mirrors the pandemic. So, the financial year beginning of April last year, when the pandemic really hit, museums had to close. So they went from from sixty four million pounds per year to twenty four million, so a sixty percent drop, as I say. The Tate had a similar kind of fall in figures from the 2019-2020 financial year to the 2020-2021 financial year, um, from ninety four million to thirty eight million pounds. The British Museums would not supply their raw figures, but they said that they had they saw a drop of ninety percent in the, the budgeted sum because of the pandemic. Did they did they even give you what that budgeted sum was? I mean, could you <laughs> right? They wouldn't give us no. Our our colleague Martin Bailey, who was gathering these figures, had trouble getting the raw numbers from them. The National Gallery, similarly, they lost they lost less money, but they didn't include their donations in this loss. So they lost fourteen million pounds, which is seems a smaller loss compared to the other museums, but they're a much smaller operation compared to say the Tate or the British Museum. 
Um, and I guess we should point out one of the other kind of major museums in the UK were quite lucky, the National Portrait Gallery. They closed for lockdown in, in March. And then because they already had this kind of huge uh, refurbishment building plan in the works for the summer, they just stayed closed. Yeah, that was sort of a coincidental timing that served that institution. It was, yeah. So they'd already let staff go before that. So they'd already planned to be closed for half the year. So they were in some ways, some ways fortunate that timing was kind of right for that. Now, you contacted the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, basically the the UK Culture Ministry about this, because, of course, these financial figures are that bad that they are going to need to help out these institutions and they've announced various tranches of funding. Could you get any more detail about how they're going about doing that um, and, and, you know, how they're going to be plugging these financial gaps that these uh, institutions have have incurred as part of this this, uh, desperate situation? Well... No, we didn't get much more detail than than was announced earlier this month. So at the beginning of March, during the budget here in the UK, an extra kind of £90 million of funding, of emergency funding was announced to help the national museums, so the 15 nationally sponsored museums. And that some, we're not 100% sure when that is meant to be, or what period that's meant to be covering. We we couldn't get the exact dates from the DCMS or the Treasury. Um, They both kind of passed us back and forth and... And it clearly that 90 million wouldn't, wouldn't cover the, the losses I've just mentioned earlier. They did announce an extra 100 million last year as well. But again, the details on that, when it's being spent and where it's going are slightly cloudy. And we were unable to get more clarity on that from, from the relevant government people. And from speaking to museums and, 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 and people at museums, it looks like it's going to take maybe two to three years for it to get back to a kind of normal end and maybe and probably around five years, for example, the V&A's deputy director, Tim Reeve, told us uh, at the end of last year that it might take up to five years to reach pre-COVID highs. So it's going to be a long road to going back to normal. Indeed it is. Jose, thanks so much for telling us about it on the podcast. Thanks very much, Ben. You can read the Visitor Figures 2020 report in the April print edition of the art newspaper online at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iPhone and iPad, which you can get from the App Store. In a moment, Amy Dawson speaks to Chris Unit about museums' digital initiatives and Michael Armitage and Julie Meritu talk about Titian. But first, here are some of the top stories on the art newspaper's website this week. The news discussed on last week's podcast about Germany laying the groundwork to return Benin bronzes in museum collections to Nigeria has raised questions about an exhibition about the bronzes that was intended to be one of the first shows at the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. In an interview with the German publication Der Spiegel, Benedict Savoy, the co-author of a report on African heritage in French museums, said she didn't believe the bronzes could be displayed. Blood sticks to the Benin bronzes, she said. But as Catherine Hickley reports, the curators of the Berlin exhibition, now scheduled for early 2022, are forging ahead with their plans. Jonathan Fine, the head curator at the Ethnological Museum in Berlin, said that criticism of the show had been, quote, wildly fantastical because most of the people criticising it have no idea what it's going to say. In a sign of deepening dissent at the Detroit Institute of Arts, seven members of its board have resigned amid a controversy over the leadership of the museum's director, Salvador Salor Pons. As Nancy Kenny writes, he's been accused of dictatorial behaviour and an insensitivity to race and gender in managing the museum. This was after an embarrassing leak of a recording of a confidential presentation before the board last November, in which investigators from a law firm hired to conduct an inquiry reported that Salor Pons tolerated no contradictions to his views or policies in managing the museum and retaliated against staff members who disagreed with him. And finally, in the latest on NFTs or non-fungible tokens, a group of some of the biggest players in blockchain, including Ethereum and Consensus co-founder Joe Lubin, have announced the launch of Palm, an alternative network for NFTs that is 99% more energy efficient than the current Ethereum blockchain. Up to now, NFTs have been notoriously inefficient environmentally. The other co-founders are Joe Haig, the owner of Henny Publishing, and David Heyman, the founder of Heyday Films, who produced the Harry Potter movies. Damien Hurst will launch the Palm platform with the Currency Project, a series of 10,000 unique oil paintings on paper, created five years ago and tied to corresponding NFTs. 
Do also seek out Ben Munster's analysis of the NFT phenomenon, which you can read along with all these stories at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Through the 16th of April, Christie's New York will host a series of live and online auctions dedicated to photographs and prints and multiples. Discover striking works from leading contemporary artists such as Yayoi Kusama, Banksy, Joan Mitchell, Irving Penn, Man Ray and Ansel Adams. Make history with the vanguard street photographers of the post-war years and engage with Christie's International Head of Photography, Darius Himes, through the Specialist Chat series on Christie's YouTube channel. These auctions offer something for those just beginning their collecting journeys and for seasoned collectors alike. Find out more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, as their doors close with those devastating effects we heard about earlier, museums rush to develop their digital strategies. But how do they fare and what can they do next? Amy Dawson, our associate digital editor and co-producer of this podcast, spoke to Chris Unit, the founder of One Further, a digital consultancy for the arts industry. So let's start by talking about, in kind of March time last year, what ways did museums immediately react to the need to put things online um, once they'd closed? So the immediate reaction from what I saw was to take any activity that they'd already planned and try and find another outlet for it. They were busy unproducing events, exhibitions and that kind of thing. And so where they'd invested some time in setting those up, they were trying to find another way of getting those out there to the world in whatever form they could. The quality of those, I think it's fair to say, varied quite widely, but I think there was a receptive audience for it. People were quite forgiving uh, of uh, things like poor audio and video quality and that kind of thing. Uh, But this was all being done at the same time that People were trying to get their heads around working from home, how to juggle childcare, how to um, deal with all the other stuff that had just been flung at them. So I was impressed by anyone that managed to do anything at that time, quite frankly. Uh, I think the other thing that we saw is that there were some institutions that have been, they got their digital houses in order quite early on and, uh, and beforehand. And I think it was less of an issue for them translating to doing digital work because they were already doing it and already doing it quite well. So organisations like Tate and so on that had big digital native programmes of activity, some of those saw big upticks in the kind of numbers that they were getting, the reach they were getting, the amount of traffic that were coming from things like Google Classroom that teachers were now being forced to use. I mean, absolutely. Our website was a case in point in terms of that big uptick in March as all kind of institutions closed and we were locked down here in the UK and and in Europe and progressively across the world. I wanted to talk about, as you said, the quality of these things. And I remember writing at the time, there was this huge kind of um, uptake of live streaming, whether it be on social media through Instagram Lives, for example, or through Zoom. And one of the things that I really found was that the art world is used to being so polished and being so visually appealing that the idea of doing these kind of lo-fi streaming things, it kind of grated and there was kind of an adjustment that needed to be done. Do you think that the quality has got better or do you think that the art world has got used to low quality in terms of audio and visuals? Well, I think in the first flush of all of this, there was a bit of a leveller because if you looked at the uh, BBC News and the evening chat shows and all that kind of thing, they were wrestling with the same stuff. It was things being done over Zoom, poor quality, guests who didn't know what a ring light was, let alone have one in the house. So there was a bit of a learning curve there and the standard was pretty low uh, across the board. So it didn't stand out too badly. I think the dropping quality... I think it was a healthy thing overall. I think for too long, there's been the attitude that everything has to be absolutely on point or it's not worth doing at all. And I think a little bit of a drop in in quality standards has led to some good quality content coming through. So I think that was 
quite good. But I think one of the big changes that you look back um, 12 months and see now, some of the production values have gone up. And people, while people have got used to the tools, they've got used to the better quality cameras and uh, tidying up their backgrounds and things like that. I think that has helped uh, a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, our very own podcast host, Ben Luke, has bought a ring light. (laughs) Um, He's now basically an influencer. (laughs) So let's talk about how content has changed and also the strategies from museums and other cultural organisations to putting that content up and the kinds of things that they're doing. Can you give some examples of early kind of content from some organizations and then you know how that's changed and some of the ones that we're seeing now yeah so so to begin with it was just uh what have we got that we can translate online quickly and simply and i think that was done with very little strategy in place for that that it wasn't really coherent there wasn't much use of all the advances in understanding around audience development that have grown up over the decades all went out the window just in the name of getting some sort of visibility and uh, and making some use of the investment in in programming and so on that had been been done so i think one of the things that's improved over time is that background thinking into who is it we're trying to engage with on what sort of level and for, with what sort of objectives in mind are we looking to is it useful for us to look at reach is it revenue that we're looking at are we trying to build partnerships a lot of these things weren't possible to do in the first couple of months because things were there was so much uncertainty i mean there's uncertainty now but it was even more so back then we all thought that we were initially locking down for six weeks <laughs> let alone 12 months and more so i think that uh, the thinking that went behind things has moved on a bit. I think there's also been more of a recognition of how artistic digital experiences can fit in with people's lives and their needs uh, a bit more. My colleague Alex did a survey of uh, social media managers, mostly at uh, museums and galleries, and asked them about how their social media output had changed over the past year or so so pre-pandemic and then during and as you'd expect there was a big shift away from looking at uh, events and exhibitions and things that people could attend and there was much more of a move towards looking at uh, objects subject matter the stories that exist within uh, within collections uh, and within longer running exhibitions there was a shift towards even wider subject matter than that so looking at there was quite a strand around wellness and people's mental health and that kind of thing. And and especially some of the larger institutions thinking that they've got a role to play in just uh, acting as a bit of a soothing balm for the population at this time. And then there were all sorts of people who were throwing uh, caution to the wind and doing all sorts of interesting creative things. The Getty Challenge, where they got people to dress up as artworks, had some fantastic stuff in it. Um, Yorkshire Museums, uh, with their... Uh, their curator battle, pulling out the weirdest, wonderful and most objectionable objects from collections across the country and doing that kind of collaboration was really fun. Um, The Royal Academy of Arts with their Daily Doodle Challenge, which started off as quite a fun thing, but then roping other uh, institutions into that and uh, spreading that and doing it as a bit more of an informal collaboration. So I think those were without wanting to get too highfalutin about it, but expanded the possibilities of what can be done through digital communication and building a community of people around the objects and subject matter of uh, some of these institutions. Definitely. And I think there's been a huge shift towards engagement. I mean, it's one of those metrics that people always measured in social media. But this past year certainly has been more about trying to get people involved in ways that they can't physically. And I actually did some research as part of our visitor figures survey for this year and looking at social media, adding up the total number of followers on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter for the top 100 museums and coming up with the top 20. And there are a few particularly interesting findings, one of which is that Twitter had previously been the most popular platform for museums And 
Instagram has now overtaken with a huge growth in the past year. So MoMA came out as the most followed museum on social media. And looking at their content, they do a really wide range of stuff, of course. Like you say, looking at some specific objects. Having spoken to Rob Baker, who leads the social media at the museum, he was talking about how they developed over the past year for social media. And it moved more from just talking about the museum to really engaging with what was happening in current events and not just corona but also obviously they had the election in america last year and so they were trying to use the museum social media to kind of reflect on and not necessarily you know take a side but to really kind of try and talk to the community that they have about what was going on and i think that that is why they grew so exponentially. Can you talk about some other examples? What other museums have reacted in this kind of way or in other ways that have been successful? Well, I think the ones that went for reach in what they were doing, they were doing big programmes and making those free and opening up to the wider world. It was really easy to see what they were doing, but there was a lot of smaller scale local activity that sort of went a little bit under the radar. But there were some organisations decided they were just going to double down on local community and that is where they could and should have the greatest impact. So a couple of that did that, so Rich Mix, uh, which is in East London, they very much went for that approach and they worked with local artists and they were creating murals around the local area, commissioning freelance artists to, to do that kind of work. I think also the smaller institutions... I mean, this was a good way for them to go. They're not going to get the... They haven't got the the objects of national significance in quite the same concentration that the, the large national museums have got. So they're unlikely to have things that dial into the national curriculum to such a great extent. They, were, they probably saw their numbers go, go down a bit across the board. And they probably recognised that it was going to be the local community who were going to have their backs and support them if they got into trouble. Uh, financially. There was a great deal of uncertainty around that. So that was who they were best off serving, especially smaller institutions that have large volunteer uh, workforces as well, keeping close to them and looking after what they were doing. I also think the um, the smaller institutions have a little less to lose. They can be a little bit more creative, a bit more collaborative, whereas the larger organisations, they were a bit slower to get going because it's hard enough collaborating internally, let alone externally. And whenever anything goes out the door, it's going to have eyeballs on it. And so it's a little bit more complicated. The quality of it needs to be of a certain standard. But, if, but they are more likely to have greater reach, greater potential for monetization further down the road. So slower starts than the smaller institutions, but probably uh, greater longevity. Well, let's talk about the financial aspect of this, because one of the features in our visitor figures survey by Hannah McGiven actually looks at how museums can monetize their digital content and that's really a point that we're at now a year down the road that initial need to get everything up online has kind of passed and now we're looking at for the future this new normal as museums open back up we will still want to see that digital content it will still be there These plans will already be in place, but how can museums make it worthwhile? Do you have any ideas, any thoughts on that? I think it depends the extent to which it needs to be worthwhile. A lot of uh, larger institutions have got business models that are predicated on getting a large number of people through the doors regularly, uh, paying no small amount for, uh, for tickets to blockbuster exhibitions. And so they're kind of they've gone for that model. That is hard to replace directly through digital income streams. What digital income streams could probably do is some smaller scale work that could, probably not going to make a massive dent on the balance sheet, but it could, programs of activity that could at least self, uh, self-sustain self in the first instance and maybe grow from that. There are examples of people who are doing very well. There are all sorts of uh, digital business models out there that are going very well. I sometimes think in the museum and heritage sector, 
there are aspects of those organisations that mitigate against being ruthlessly commercial in what they do. I think commercial galleries, um, the ones that uh, I've seen do very well just from selling artworks uh, online through selling artworks through through Instagram accounts that are incredibly uh, popular and incredibly profitable for them. I think in the wider uh, and especially the non-profit sector, I think the opportunity is primarily around education, especially adult learning. Um, it's through events. There are some examples of this working quite well. The uh, Barnes Foundation over in the States put some numbers out not so long ago about how their, their learning program, they've pivoted that towards digital and is doing quite well. The v Learning Academy aren't doing too badly at the moment uh, either. I don't think they've released any numbers from that, but you only have to go to their web pages to see that £400 12 session courses are selling out pretty rapidly. So I think there's some opportunities around that. One further, we've been part of an ongoing piece of research that's been uh, surveying arts attenders, mostly in the performing arts sector. And we've had quite a lot of responses to these surveys that ask about propensity to return to live events, but also what's their attitudes towards digital content as well. We're asking people of, like, of different types of content, what are you more likely to pay to pay for? And what would you expect to be free? And something that's come through that really strongly, um, virtual tours, virtual exhibitions among this group of people in particular don't seem massively popular. What people are saying that they will pay reasonable amounts before is uh, something that's got an interactive element to it and I think we've seen that as well we've seen that borne out by things like the um, uh, Oxford Museums did a night at the museum thing it was an interactive thing I can't remember the name of the uh, uh, the person they did that with but uh, I understand they had tens of thousands of people take part in this the London Transport Museum as well have been doing they've been doing um, live tours of some of the underground stations that you can't visit, you just can't get down there. So uh, being able to do this as an interactive thing, giving people access digitally to something that they wouldn't even be able to access physically anyway, is definitely a value add. So those things seem to have a higher ticket value and those tend to be quite popular from what I've seen. The other thing that we've been asking through this research is what are people's attitudes to it after they've experienced these things? Was it better, worse, or just about as expected quality-wise. And overwhelmingly, people have been saying that was a lot better than I expected it to be. So that's been encouraging. So we're starting to get an idea of what people will pay for, what museums and galleries can produce and is within their wheelhouse. And we're starting to get some good examples of things that people like um, and that are starting to be profitable. So so that's encouraging. But there's loads of other models out there. We're currently living in a time when people have digital subscriptions to so many things. 200 million people pay for Netflix. 155 million people are premium subscribers to Spotify. We obviously have membership programmes to museums, but could you see there being a digital subscription type service for cultural organisations? I do, yes. I worry about the institutional obstacles to doing something like that. But we're starting to see some of those things out there in the world. The performing arts sector is served by things like um, digital theatre, marquee TV, opera vision, and a few others, which are platforms where those kinds of uh, streaming performing arts uh, performances can be, uh, uh, can be hosted and watched. There's also things like History Hit, which is a history-focused uh, online learning platform. There's things like Masterclass as well, which uh, is very similar similar models. My worry is that if everyone tries to do this kind of thing, then there are there are literally thousands of museums in the UK, and if everyone tried to do the same kind of thing, then discovery is going to be quite a big issue at that point. Uh, I think there's some missing bits of infrastructure in terms of aiding that discovery. There are no listings for this kind of stuff uh, in the way that there are for uh, for TV, for theatre, for exhibitions. Um, so it can be quite, quite difficult to come across that. Uh, and if everyone's trying to create their own streaming platforms, then there's a lot of cost involved in everyone doing that. And 
I'm sure that's great for that's great for Vimeo and it's great for uh, some website developers, but it's not particularly great for for users. I think there's a very small number of people who will be able to stand up a um, a service like that on their own. They're more likely to be the ones that are that identify with some subject matter on quite a wide scale. So and are more likely to be able to get an international audience for uh, for what they do. Not many people fall into uh, into that kind of thing. But on the other hand, I think there is there are possibilities within very small niche communities. One of my favourite things is a uh, is an online community um, at uh, textileartist.org, which is it's run by it's a it's a family affair basically. There's a woman who retired, and she has uh, always been into uh, creating textile art. And her two youngish sons set up a website, and they've turned that into delivering online classes and now also a community. The community has two and a half thousand people in it, paying twenty pounds or dollars I can't remember what uh, per month, which is fifty thousand pounds a month, six hundred thousand pounds a year for a very small outfit doing textile art stuff. I Im- don't imagine there is a museum in the land who wouldn't quite happily have a small community like that that was well monetized allowed them to really take care of a a community i think that's the kind of model that we should be should be looking for taking inspiration from to end i wanted to talk to you you said about in your research that you conducted you asked people about their kind of desire to return to these physical spaces and i wonder can you tell us what data you receive from that and do you think that in the future we'll be seeing the digital experience living more side by side with the physical one or are we really going to drop off digitally once people can return to the real world so the responses to that have been from someone who works in the on the digital side of things quite encouraging so there was about a third of people said that yes they really enjoyed this digital content and they will continue to engage with it after it's possible to go back to experiencing things live. There's about a third of people who said, no, that was enough. I would rather go and I'd rather go and sit in a theatre or or walk around an exhibition. And for those people, there's been it's been more of a it's the second best and they've put up with it because that's the only thing they can get at the moment. And then there's a bit in the middle. So there's another third who are saying, if the offer is right, if it's something I can't otherwise get to, then I will be happy to engage with that thing through digital means. So I look at that and think, well, that's going to be the case for everything, really. I am, of course, I'm only going to be interested in engaging something if it's of interest to me. There's a great variety of things that go on around the country around the world that I can't get to. Um, uh, I live in Hertfordshire and I have a young daughter that has had quite an effect on my ability to go and visit the hot new exhibitions and whatever exciting new play is on in the West End. So being able to access this stuff from home has been quite good for me and it's uh, there's plenty of evidence that's coming out as well that says that it's good for other people who live in more ro- remote locations have accessibility needs that mean that they, for uh, for reasons of convenience, geography, um, uh, and what have you, can't attend things. So I think that there's still going to be some uh, a considerable level of interest uh, in that. Uh, it's just going to be a question of how that is married with the physical thing. We also asked. Having experienced something digitally, are you more or less interested in uh, going to that organisation in person? And this came from a place where people are worried about the digital cannibalising the physical, especially when the physical comes with um, a greater propensity for monetization through exiting through the gift shop and uh, sitting in the lovely cafe and all the all the rest of it as well. And the numbers that came back were really encouraging. People said that if they had experience something digitally they were more likely to want to engage with that organization in person well it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out in another year's time so thank you so much for speaking with me about this thank you very much for having me
You can read Amy's Insta gratification column each month in the art newspaper and Chris Unit's cultural digital newsletter is at chrisunit.co.uk. That's unit with two T's. And finally, instead of the usual work of the week, we thought we'd share a highlight from our sister podcast, A Brush With, where I talk to artists about their influences and cultural experiences. On the podcast, we discuss the historical and contemporary artists our guests most admire, and I ask, if they had to live with one work of art, what would it be? In the very first episode, Michael Armitage talks about Titian and how the artist Julie Meritu prompted him to see the painting he would most want to live with. Julie joined me on last week's episode and spoke about that same moment. And then I asked her which work she would choose. She spoke powerfully about Velasquez. I've always found it really courageous that you are not afraid to directly quote great art in your own work, in the sense that in your show in Venice, there was a painting which it seemed to me directly referred to Titian's Great Assumption in the Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that is one of the all-time great paintings. And I, and I love the fact that he were the sort of tentacles of Titian reaching forward into the 21st century from the 16th, you know. But you've got to do this in a sort of... Well, tell me about that experience. I think it's... Like, for me, the point of reference is probably from a narrative position. Like, I don't think I would choose... I wouldn't look to another artist to quote unless there was something that I wanted in the narrative of the painting from my position. Like, I'm happy for people to read whatever they want in my work, but from my position where I'm trying to build an image and trying to, to build a narrative. It's like, it's like how a mark has a history, an image has a history, a type of image making has a history and can lead and inform the way that you look at a work. And so, so like that for me, it's, it's really like a tool more than, I never saw that as a kind of homage to Titian or something like that. Um, it was more that it would be useful if I took some of that, you know, to kind of, undermine the image that I was presenting and shift the kind of reading of the image to to tell a fuller story and to try and explore the complexities of the situation I was interested in while making the painting. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? Uh, Titian's Pieta. Great choice. Yeah, that's a, it's an outrageous painting. I saw it, I saw it for the first time in Venice um, last year. And I was actually going around with um, with Julie Moretu, and she 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 introduced me to it because she was like, "You just you, you will not believe this thing." And wow, I mean, geez, that's a painting. And there, there was something that you said earlier about the tentacles of Titian reaching into the twenty first century, where th that painting is like looking at the entire history of painting both that followed it and and what led to it at one moment and i don't know any other painting that does that and there's so there's such a huge variety of language an approach to to the body to abstraction to um to telling a story to 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 what paint can do as well you see artists from you know de kooning rembrandt degas um Goya, you see everybody in that in that painting, and then you see the artists that were before him, you know, and and it's 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 the most astounding single painting, almost for that reason. I don't really, I don't really care that much for the image, you know, like, you know, I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have the image around, but as a painting, it's just out of this world. Um, Again, it's something that shouldn't work. The kind of lack of uniformity of language across the whole thing should not hold together. Um, but it does, and it feels like it's always been that way. And it's, it's a strange, strange painting. It sort of seems so extraordinary that that's the last painting as well. As a parting shot, <laughs> that's, that's one hell of a painting. Yeah. God, can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, and, and the way he, his paintings built to that moment as well. You know, um, there, there's this extraordinary show of, um, of, of, of group of Titian paintings at the National Gallery. And, and it's incredible just seeing the shifts in language. And there's something about that Pieta which holds his entire life's, like, learning of painting in that. And like you said, that, that you would leave that, you know, to sit above your grave forever it's a bonkers idea it's and that feels of its time and i don't i don't know if 
something like that could happen again or what form it would take if it did happen again. Michael Armitage came on this um, <laughs> podcast and he told me that you took him to see the Pieta by Titian in Venice and because you knew that it was going to blow him away, presumably because it had done to you. Yeah, it, that painting is a painting like no other. Venice is filled with incredible works. And when I first went to Michael's studio, I asked him about Venice and had he been there to see. And, and, I, and when we realized we would be in Venice together, I, just, I was so excited to go study all these paintings with him and show him those. But that, that Pieta, that, what happens in that painting and what happens not just with the paint, but with what happens to an artist painting at that late stage, painting for their lives in that way, and, and how that paint dematerializes in, into just paint. A life that dematerializes into that is really moving and profound. And yeah, that was a great experience. I think Michael went back several times after that to that painting. It had a, an enormous effect on him, clearly. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? Juan de Pereira is such an important painting to me. And I think I would want to always have that lesson in my life. Yeah. It's an extraordinary picture, isn't it? Because there is no sort of noble depiction of a black man in Spanish art up until that point, you know. And then there was obviously that very particular relationship where he was he was an enslaved man who was employed by Velázquez and then eventually set free by Velázquez. So it's sort of a terrifically important journey, that relationship between the artist and the sitter. Yeah. Yeah, to me that and how dehumanized somebody becomes in being somebody's object and being somebody's slave, being enslaved to someone else. And yet the deep humanity with which he's painted in that kind of, you know, the kind of profound breath that he's about to take, the expression of his eyes, the touch of his mouth, this awareness of that deep sense of being. And yet the contradiction inherent in that by being the object of one, by being one's enslaved person and being one slave and to me that there's this that contradiction and is 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 part of the contradiction in the history of art and as it's something that kind of I'm always amazed by but also moved by and um it helps me kind of find my place in the world I think in a way that that we live in these contradictions constantly we are constantly inventing within them and trying to you know locate ourselves in that space You can hear the full podcasts, A Brush with Michael Armitage and A Brush with Judy Meritu and another 12 conversations with artists wherever you're listening now. And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already done so. And please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Michalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks to Jose, to Amy and Chris. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.